I asked the, the, the presenters to leave ample time for comments and discussion. I wrote lots of notes because this is very fascinating. I'm interested in lots of similar things, but I want to open it up to, to everyone here and, and they get the ball rolling on questions, comments, you know, Chris. It'll be first come, first serve. Uh, first, thank you for that very rich presentation. So, listening to it, I had um, an insight, which I, I want to know if, if you think this insight is valid based on what you present. So, um, the idea that, you know, in esoteric Buddhism, um, we understand ultimate reality, Mahavala Shaiva, through the correspondences in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see this with language. So we're, there's, there's, there's this constant effort to, to, to see how things correspond to, to each other. Um, three mysteries being the base. Okay. Uh, and that lays kind of the, the groundwork for how we can think about language that then what's already takes over. But, but what they're both doing, what K2 and what what's already are both doing, is they're trying to get to some ultimate reality. And in, in the case of K2, it's Mahabharata Chana and the cosmos. In the case of Motobori, it's the way of the cosmos. But this is my thought on how they differ that I want to get your feedback. The thought of how they differ is that Kichu, there's nothing really mediated to get there. The language, the language of the correspondence we see in the language can get us directly to uh, the ultimate concept truth. But with Motobori, it's being mediated by the social world. In other words, we 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 can see that by by understanding language properly as directly revealing the truth of the ancients, the ancient social world. Then we can, by understanding that, we can then understand the way of the time. So without without understanding first the the way of the ancients, we can't understand the way of the the comedy. So there is. You have to first get to understanding the way of the ancients through their language, and then you can understand the way of the Catholic. So there's a mediation. Do you think that's true? I'm not sure I agree. I actually think there is a level of mediation with K2 as well, because he's he has this kind of effort to revive these past practices, right? Much like Joel. Um, so there it's not just contemporary language that he's interested in kind of working out the pronunciation of. Um, he's saying that we need to have the proper pronunciation of uh, the poems of the mind motion, right? So this is, there is a remove there. It's not, um, I mean, it's very similar to Nodinaga, I would say. Um, and in that sense, I think there's, there's, medi I'm not sure if mediation is really the right term, because I, I, I feel like um, what, what's really interesting about Nodinaga and Keishu is that they don't take this kind of instrumentalist approach to language. Um, and this is something different from someone like Ogyu Sodai, right? So Ogyu Sodai's Kobunji Gaku is typically the kind of intellectual school that Kobugaku is is kind of understood as deriving from. That's the kind of genealogy that we see conventionally presented in, in modern scholarship. Um, and, and, and in like the, the early 20th century scholarship, which is of course modern uh, as, as well. Um, but, but the difference here, I think, is this fundamentally different understanding of, of, of language, right? So with, I, there's like much more mediation with someone like Sorai, um, who wants to recover the, the language of the, uh, the Confucian classics so that he can have a proper understanding of these texts in order to implement uh, proper governance in contemporary Japan. That, that's really not what Keiichi and Nobunaga are doing. Right? They, they kind of understand language as um, disclosing reality. Um, so there isn't that kind of mediation there, if that makes sense. So there's a follow-up. So yeah, and there are two different, one is using esoteric Buddhism, the other is using kind of Confucian idea of flow. Yeah. Okay, so here's, I'm going to be my last follow-up question about this. I have other follow-up questions about the term. But here's, in, the, in Keichi and Jobo, do, is the social world important for getting to the ultimate world? The social, the contemporary social world? Or even, even any social, past social world. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. So that's to me, that's the key difference. Right, right. But, but, but I mean, 
but is the is, is the social world really important to Norinaga? That that I mean, it's the language of the ancients that that directly signifies the truth, the ways of the kami for Norinaga. I'm not sure that this, the social world is actually that important for Norinaga. Um, but thank you, thank you for those questions. Um, thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I thought you made a very compelling case for this direct link between Jogo and Keichu and in Norinaga. Um, and you talked about, you, know, so you set this up very well to demonstrate the link. Um, one of the things you didn't talk about was Norinaga's virulent anti Buddhist rhetoric, which adds a level of irony because if it's true that he inherits his philological methods from essentially you know, Buddhist methodology, um, then what does this mean when he comes out and he absolutely decries um, Buddhism as this invasive foreign religion that's corrupted the soul of Japan? So then, so then so I wonder what Nori Naga would himself think about your interpretation. Uh, you would hate um, right? <laughs> well, you know, anyway, that'd be okay. um, I, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, though, so, so you established this sort of direct link, right? So we've got Joe going to Keichu to Nori Naga. But, but there are also indirect influences that could be going on here. And I just wonder how much you consider those. And I, I know in my own recent work, I've been very interested in um, spells, martial spells. And then particularly by the time we get to um, say the 1670s, 1680s, the late 17th century, we have woodblock printed books of martial spells, which lay out an illustration, mudras that you perform um, and then the exact and kana, the, the incantation you use to perform particular acts in battle and fighting for various purposes. And so these are mass produced, these are suffusing um, the market. People are really aware of this. And then the emphasis again on sound, on the sound of the words. And so this, you know, I just wondered about, you know, the, the, the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times in Norinaga that comes along. In the 18th century, is born into this world where the book market uh, is full of these sorts of manuals. I don't full of them. They're, they're, they exist. They're, they're there. Um, and so it would be interesting to consider not just the direct connections between, say, Nordinaga, Keichu, and Jogen, but also more broadly the sort of the milieu that he was working mm -hmm. in. I don't know if you've been in that spot. Yeah, definitely. Um, so maybe I'll start with the first question about Buddhist, or, um, Norinaga's anti-Buddhist um, inclination. I mean, I would say he's much more anti-Confucian than he is anti-Buddhist, right? He's a practicing Buddhist his whole life. I mean, he has a, he, he read, he's very well versed in the esoteric Buddhist tradition. I mean, he copies out the passages of Dar Jing. Uh, he co copies out Muju. Um, so, so he's, it's not just coming from Keiju. He, he's kind of very open to it, even as, I mean, he, he's kind of attracted to it, even as he, he, of course, has this kind of explicit rhetoric about wanting to expunge all continental influence, whether it be Buddhist or Confucian, um, from this kind of idealized idea of, of ancient Japan that he thinks can be recovered. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that, Obviously, he would not like to be told, right, that um, he's he's basically kind of stripping away the explicit Buddhism from a Buddhist framework and implementing it in his own work, because, I mean, that is obviously counter to what he believed he was doing. Um, and he definitely would not want to kind of equate, equate um, his investigation into Waka as similar to, you know, just some kind of Waka Dharani theory. Um, okay, so so I see it worse that you made these allegations against him in English. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah. As for other influences, I mean, obviously there are other influences, and I, and yeah, this is actually something I kind of wondered about in this paper because. I, I, I'm not trying to suggest that there are no other influences that, that ever, you know, affected Dorinaga's thought. Um, Motori Ohira, actually, very, who is his, um, his adopted son and heir um, in, in his school, the Suzunoya draws out this diagram of various influences on Dorinaga. Ikechi is, is one of them, um, but Ogi Sarai is another, Ogi Keizan, um, who was his, uh, who was his, 
instructor during his kind of student days in Kyoto in the 1750s is another. I mean, Hori Pezan was a Neo Confucian, um, but he also introduced Minada to both Keiju's work and to Sodai's work and has connections to both of those men. Um, obviously, what's going on, uh, I mean, the print market. Definitely influential. Norinaga remarks himself that kind of this um, explosion of, of print in the last 50 years has fundamentally changed what scholarship is. He sort of notes that 30 years ago, um, Keichu's Manyo Dai Shoki couldn't even be found. It wasn't accessible at all. So yes, there's, there's a lot of kind of various influences out there um, that I think could be incorporated into, into this paper. Um, and actually, if, if people have thoughts about how much should be incorporated into the final JJRS paper, um, I would I would love to hear it because I, I, on the one hand, I don't wanna get kind of off track, right? Um, but on the other hand, obviously that, that's important. Um, also what's important, I think, um, is the Tokugawa Bakufu, who is, you know, just sponsoring um, kind of efforts within these Buddhist lineages to return to kind of the origins, um, to revive um, their textual and scriptural traditions. Um, the, the publication of the Daisokyo is, is also important, right? Here are all these Buddhist uh, texts that are now relatively readily available. Um, so yeah, I, I don't mean to suggest that this kind of direct lineage between Joe Lin and Keiju and Norinaga is the only the influence there. Including all of those influences. So the, the limitation of this paper, I asked the, the, the authors to limit to 10,000 words, so that, that might be too much, but it would be a good one to write. Jackie's next. Well, thank you for a really fascinating paper. You make a very compelling case for your two points, first of all, that uh, they just lost their Kukaku. Philology is not a value for neutral scientific enterprise for definite ideological and metaphysical underpinnings, and that those derived from esoteric Buddhism is really fascinating. My question may be somewhat peripheral. No, I think especially on the esoteric side, there's so many resonances, resonances between your paper and the work of W. Giave and then Richard Payne, Patrick, um, Buddhist language in Japan. Yeah. My question may be somewhat uh, peripheral, but I'm interested in the shift that we see uh, as you present it between Joe Lund and the Keishu and Morinaga, where Joe Lund is making the claim that all language is potentially mantra and the vehicle by which you know, we can access uh, underlying meaning and that the connections in the, in the world, uh, in the body of, in the body and mind of uh, Daichi Norai. Um, but then uh, with Keishu, uh, somehow this applies specifically to Japanese. And, and of course, he's not the first. You know, as you mentioned, you know, Muju uh, had this assertion that, uh, he, you know, Waka or the Durani in Japan, he's not the only person in, in that early part of the medieval period who making that kind of assertion. Uh, I'm wondering what the basis for that is. is. Is there ever a basis presented for why Japanese particularly, or is it just a matter of assertion? Yeah, I don't, I don't think he's actually necessarily saying that only Japanese. But there's, right? there's something particular about the Japanese language, but certainly by the time we get to um, Norinaga. Oh, that would definitely with Norinaga. Norinaga. <laughs> I, I, I would say that, that, that Keiji is actually taking a very kind of universalist. Um, I mean, I, I would say he's almost seeing out one logical conclusion of what Joel is saying. I mean, from from um, the Dainichikyo, right? That that uh, uh, and Dainichikyo show that the written language of languages of the world all signify um, meaning. Um, and I mean, in in some ways, Joel Wan is more narrow. Because he's only looking at Siddham. And Keiichi is really expanding that. He, yeah, he's not looking at other languages per se. I mean, and he does make the claim that we see obviously earlier with people like Jian um, that Japanese is closer to, to Siddham, to Sanskrit, than Chinese, right? So he does have this kind of logic of equivalence between India and, and Japan, between uh, Kana and Siddham, in, in, as a way of 
kind of the, yeah, kind of minimizing the significance of China. Um, he even think it's not that significant. I mean, you see it in spots, um, but at other times, I mean, he's he's very um, eclectic, perhaps is the word in his citation. I mean, this makes Gaethje really annoying to read actually because he's always constantly citing from everything. Um, but he, I mean, he cites from Confucian texts all the time. Um, so, so there isn't really this kind of detrimental attitude toward Chinese, even though there's kind of glimpses of it here and there um, in, in his writings. So yeah, I, I think that with Keiqiu, it's, it, it's a broadening of, of this kind of claim um, or, or kind of a seeing through of this claim that the various regional languages of the world signify. With Norinaga, absolutely, it's, it's just Japanese. Right. It just seems like from what you just said, it's very interesting that the Japanese replaces or displaces Sidham. Yeah. And of course, Sidham, you know, that goes back to these, you know, Indian ideas that the universe originates with the grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's really foundational to the esoteric concept, but then that gets replaced by Japanese. Right. Right, right. Not, um, I mean, it's like a sleight of hand, right? Not you're taking, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're taking kind of that conceptual framework and then doing away with the content of it and replacing it. With so it does sound like it's related to these, these ideas in, in which Japan and India flip positions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Noriaga Motori was uh, certainly not underappreciated, I think, in Western scholarship. He's one of the big, the Molinari Molinari is the aesthetic. Um, Benjamin Elman, in his paper, uh, Sinophiles and Sinophobes, uh, went through uh, Noriaga Motori and his uh, said, said, said basically that the Confucianism, uh, the, the barbarians, the uh, Manchus, the Waigoren, had destroyed at that time uh, the Han uh, civilization. Uh, and so this was his bid to reclaim Confucianism. And he said that um, all of the Confucian learning was actually resident in Japan before it was written down in China. And the Japanese are better than the Chinese because they didn't need to write it down. Chinese are kind of stupid, so they had to write it down. So that's why the, the Japanese are better. This was Elman's take on, on that uh, I philology. I don't yes. think Norinaga makes that claim. Elman says he does. <laughs> And, and that it's a bid to reclaim all of Confucian learning as nativist Japanese. And it sounds thing. like Yamazaki Ansai, maybe, but not Morinaga. Okay. Yeah. So um, this tradition, then, which becomes national learning. Um, yeah. Uh, my, my question is uh, how much it, is it fair to interpret? This as being important in um, Sadanobu Matsudaira and Atsukane Hirata, and then later the, the development of uh, state ideology, I guess. I'm not sure I'm following your question. So, how, how important is Norinaga's Hokugaku to the kind of Confucian orthodoxy, neo Confucian orthodoxy established by Matsudaira and Sadanobu? Yeah, and then secondarily, um, I guess, yeah, secondarily in the state ideology around 1890, 1910. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't actually think it's particularly important to, um, to Matsudaira. We have with you know, Gata Sakane, now that, that is sort of more in its spoken back with as opposed to Confucianism. Um, definitely Norinaga is influential there. Uh, I mean, we, we have with Atsutane a kind of move away from the philology, right, that is, has been commented on um, quite widely. He's not as interested in the text. He's not as interested. I mean, he, ha he has more of this sense that the spirit of the kami can be found in the present. It doesn't necessarily have to go through these ancient texts. And ultimately, Atsane is more influential sort of around the, the main restoration and the establishment of, of the state Shinto. Um, so there, there is a kind of disconnect there. When you, um, you said today that um, that you <laughs> said today that is more about um, work in progress. So my question also is work in progress. Um, I know 
I never read Cage myself, I admit that. So I'm relying a little bit on Mark Sutterman, who wrote about him in 2000 as kind of predecessor for Kogaku as well. And he um, especially focuses on the concept of Muji that Keiju uses. Um, look at my case, I've never read him. So um, it's kind of a partiality in approach. And two, two kinds of questions, one is referring to color as well. Is Monodinaka maybe um, taking Keiju's scholarship part, like this impartiality approach, and doesn't take over his criticism, religion part, so he separates that. So even if Monodinaka, as you said, not so much, but even if he rejects Buddhism, he can still, of course, use the approach, the methods of scholarship. I mean, I think, hand, uh, yeah, I think that's typically how Keiju's influence is understood on Monodinaka, right? Um, that I, I've actually do a bit more. Oh, well, it's so sorry. It's just one. Okay. So that is work in progress. Yeah. Okay. Um, so separation of religion is what should be sense. And also, just can you put in then like this this Muji, the concept of impartiality? Can you explain it a little bit more, maybe? Um, in this approach, if not, is also okay. Just because this is what put my focus on a little bit. And then the other thing is, of course, we shouldn't solely at least, we shouldn't um, rely on this orthodox photograph with image only, and of course, um, you clearly pointed out that there are other examples, and Keijo, of course, is a big one. Um, I was wondering if there's this direct influence on Motori no Ninaga, or if it's still going through the orthodox account of Mabuchi um, image, because Keijo and Mabuchi work on Manyoshu, and there comes maybe an influence on the Manu Manyoshu scholarship of Kaunamabuchi, and then this influences Motori Nodinaka, or is it really direct, is Nodinaka directly using Keiju as such? That would be my kind of second question. Yeah, I mean, we don't see as much this emphasis on um, graph, the phonocentric graph, the phonemic graph in, in Mabuchi as we do in, in Nodinaka. So, and in and Norinaga is, of course, directly reading Keiji if you didn't, didn't meet him. Um, but I would say that there's a lot more similarities between Keiji and, and Norinaga. Although, of course, Mabuchi is, is influential as well. I mean, and, and Mabuchi reads Keiji as well. So there's some influence. There's various levels of influence, you could say, um, that, that, can be, that can be discerned. Um, sort of returning to, to the first question about whether we can separate kind of religion from philology, perhaps from methodology in Keiju, and is it not only methodology that Morinaga is borrowing from Keiju? Um, that was sort of what I was trying to argue against, right? That it's, I mean, so this, this, um, as I was starting to say, uh, has been the understanding of Keiju that the Buddhism was kind of peripheral to what he was doing. Um, Peter Nasco says, despite being a Buddhist monk, uh, Keiju was philologically rigorous. Um, and I mean, Muraoka says something very similar. He says, oh, well, Keiju wasn't a priest of Buddhism, really. He was a priest of the truth. Um, <laughs> right? Like, uh, like so, so there's been a long tendency of separating that. I mean, which Norinaga himself sort of uh, instigates. You could say like, that's what he thinks he's doing, right? That that somehow, yeah, he was a he was a priest, he was a Buddhist, unfortunately, but that is not fundamental to his work. Um, and what I had tempted to do today was sort of to say, no, no, that's not true at all. Um, his his Buddhism is actually fundamental to his philology. Uh, and I guess what I'm what I'm trying to argue is that despite his claim that he has separated this, he has not in fact, right? That that basically he is um he is incorporating the kind of underlying premises that are Buddhist in orphan from K2 into his own work. Um and perhaps not being not being aware of it. Um and renaming it, you know, the, the way of um, the way of, of the ancients of Japan. Um, in terms of Keiju's impartiality, I mean, that is another thing. I mean, I think it actually goes hand in hand um, with this idea that maybe Keiju's Buddhism 
um, his kind of Buddhist affiliations were not fundamental to his work, right? Because, like, because as I as I mentioned earlier, um, he has this kind of eclecticism to him. Um, he's he's drawing um, on the Buddhist tradition, but he's also drawing on, on the Confucian tradition, the Waka tradition, and he's very steeped in all of those. Um, and at times suggests that they are all right. Um, and at times it's, it's kind of contradicts that position as well. Um, but but I think it's because of that that it's sort of it, it's been easy to sort of push away his, his Buddhism and say, no, he was a priest of the truth. <laughs> or um, that that was not actually fundamental to his thought. Uh, I'm Kasu from uh, Dr. Today. Uh, my question is more like uh, I don't know if I didn't understand uh, correctly, but uh, very much he uh, always uh, emphasizes the power of the literature to uh, move the uh, sentiments of the emotional feelings of people uh, through literature. Uh, and that's the correct way of the uh, reading of the Kojiki and uh, Game of uh, Monogatari would uh, it would be a good literature if uh, it moved uh, the emotional feeling of people. So uh, my question is like uh, he uh, he saw this same uh, emotional moving on and uh, buddhist mantras and uh, buddhist literatures like like you said uh, it was more like uh, confucianism uh, uh, the, the way of the kami but i didn't understand well uh, his connection to the uh, buddhist uh, literature so could you okay i mean so, so he he talks about. Um, I mean, I think you're referring to kind of his early works where he's talking, where he he, he talks about momono aware repeatedly, right? And and what constitutes good literature is something that evokes momono aware that moves moves a person to to feeling. Um, he actually has a very kind of anti-Confucian understanding of momono. Um, and I would, I've actually written an article about this in, in Monument and Monica, but, but I argue that actually this notion that Mono no Awae is itself a kind of um, enlightenment comes from Buddhism too. So we can actually trace this back to someone like Fujiwara Mashunze, um, who, who creates, who, who makes these equivalences, right, between the Buddhist tradition and, and Mono no Awae, between Waka and um, and the three truths. Part of Norinaga's kind of strident anti Confucianism um, comes, and, and Buddhism as well, but, but comes from his, his notion that these are traditions that suppress human emotion, that don't allow you to truly be a person, right? To truly feel. There's all of this kind of um, uh, protocol. That is impressed upon her as someone about what it means to be to act properly. Um, and this is something that he's really, really uh, pushing back against. And he really has this almost ritualistic understanding of language, right? If you can really access Momoma Awa, you can access the kind of pure feelings of the people of the past that are untrammeled by you know, these adulterations, these. these almost inhuman um, directives to act in certain Buddhist or Confucian ways, then you can truly become, and he doesn't say enlightened, um, but, but something similar, right? That is sort of the ultimate goal of humanity. Um, and I actually think there, again, there is a kind of deep intellectual depth to the Buddhist Baka tradition. あの、
、いろいろ聞いていうのの限界っていうのがあったと思うんです。それはあの、えー、古事記伝の方が言ってきたときに、あの、宇宙図を、あの、服部、服部中爪が書いたですね、宇宙図を一緒につけて、あの、元より乗りながら出す。そしてまたあの、えー、あの、厚田では、あの、自分の玉の見橋があって、ほとんど図ですよね。つまり、あの、ほとんどは考えなんですけれども、フィロロギーっていうものの限界がよくわかってる。つまり、言葉で言葉を説明するんではなくて、そう思ってこないと、宇宙がわからないっていうことになった時に、彼らの学問っていうのはフィロロギーも中心なんだけど、もうちょっと交渉学っていうか、あの、科学も取り入れたり、歴史も取り入れたりする交渉学として見た方が、彼らの方は多分、その、前の国学者と違うのはやっぱり図を用いてるんです、うんうん。そういうふうに思います。はい。はい、あの、英語で返事してもいいですか<笑>あの、そうですね。I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you're right that the, the kind of shift between, between Norinaga, so is, a, is this more kind of philological text based approach, and someone like Atsutane is, I mean, he's more cosmological. Right, and then this, of course, is is evident in 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 the the kind of maps that he presents, the the, the images that he presents. Um, although, I mean, I, I'm not, and I and this is something I struggled with too. Is is it? Am I sort of overextending myself in a way that is unnecessary by making this comparison to European mythology? Um, but but I think there's there's actually a kind of Um, a, a similarity even between what the European the German philologists are trying to do and something like the cos cosmology of someone like Atstane,、um, because they're trying to kind of recreate the world, right? There's a kind of cosmological dimension to it.、Um, and yes, I mean, how you do this, the means by which you do this,、um, differs. Norinaga. And the German philologists feel like this you could recreate this world, this kind of cosmological world,、um, through texts. And Atstane sort of starts to move, move away from the texts. But the goal is. is, is, is. Okay, I have a question.、Um, just going back to, to kind of the background information we gave at the beginning, we talked about the Meiji period scholars like, like Haga, I think this is the major thing you're talking about. Kind of confirm my position of ignorance because I don't know anything about, about these individuals and their use of language and particularly religion. So, so the way I understood you, your explanation was they were proposing sort of a, a, a modern form of philology that was not religious. So, what did they conceive of to be religious? Because at that time, there were huge debates. I mean, Tukyo was a neologism.、Um, people like Inoue Inoue and Inoue and Inoue and Hizijiro were. To define you know, Shukyo and Hisagaku and all of these things. But I'm wondering that the philologists were trying to define philology. What was their conception of religion that they said, well, we're doing is not religion? Right, right, right. I mean, I almost feel like it's a negative definition, right? It is the absence of science. It is the absence of this kind of scientific, objective,、um, rational approach.、Mm -hmm. And so once you stray away from that, that is religion.、Really mm -hmm. um, and In, in many ways, I mean, this is the kind of direction that philology itself was moving.、Um, so there's a, there's a pretty significant marked shift between philology as it sort of takes shape in, in the 18th and 19th centuries and then philology as it evolves. I don't know if it evolves, but as it progresses, these are all elevated terms, but as it develops. Um, Sheldon Pollock actually, in his introduction to、um, that kind of deep volume of philology, really kind of traces this, this development.、Um, and he actually kind of attributes it to what he says is philology's march to the bottom from being the queen of the humanities to like、uh, what Dull, I think, as he puts it, quoting somebody, but I can't recall who,、um, the kind of what is it? Maybe endeavors of dull girls and boys, or something like that, right?、Um, or the pursuits of dull boy, boys and girls.、Um, and so there, there is this shift where philology itself is sort of stops being understood as this interpretive, kind of almost hermeneutic、mm -hmm. um, pursuit and gets to be understood by Grauman Jacobson, I think, says philology is the act of reading. Well, 
Right. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about what is the law, the law of debate. I mean, it's been the topic of, of numerous journal medical or journals kind of special issues and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think I think there is this kind of misunderstanding, which which you see with Haga, which you see with you know more recently with someone like Koyas and Novotin, he's argued that we cannot understand gender. Uh, we're not going to add a philologist mm -hmm. because philology cannot have these kind of religious implications or these nativist implications. So it's, it has to do with you know, the, the change of philology itself. Yeah, it does seem parallel to the, the German situation where they're moving away from biblical hermeneutics and theology and saying we're doing something that's right. really best. That is a very kind of good, very interesting comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just a quick question. What do you think of uh, Basil Hall Chamberlain's translation and its legacy? What did he get right? What did he get right? Oh, no, I don't know that I think there is anything about it, to be honest, um, uh, of the Kojiki. Um, I mean, obviously, he, he puts Latin <laughs> um, to, to this to, to kind of gloss places that he thought was. Kind of inappropriate. I, 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 I mean, it's very dated, right? <laughs> yeah, he didn't. He didn't apprehend Sanyo Ryder. He thought that was just sort of garbage, boring literature. And so I'm wondering what he got right, what he got wrong. It seems is, is there any good translation of the Flodiki around? The other two, I think, are, are quite contested. Right. I mean, I, I when I teach the Kojiki in my class, briefly, I use Gustav Hell's version. But I mean, obviously, that has problems. I don't know that I necessarily like the kind of translation of all names. It gets very, very confusing. Uh, I feel like if they had done it once and then kind of reverted to the Japanese names, it would have been better. Um, but that is what I but that is what I use. I don't know. Um, I, I guess I can't say that I have that much insight on. Jimmy, thank you so much for this talk. I, it's probably on me. I think I missed it um, in your talk, but I just kind of, I mean, there's lots of uh, questions starting with Francis and his question, and then the next question. I'm wondering about um, the role of religion in the development of philology itself. I'm thinking about people like Friedrich Montesquieu. Right, and the ways that they may try to, to have gotten beyond biblical hermeneutics, but they still ended up reifying religion in a different way. They just changed the level at which they were positing religion. So Mueller had to sort of get beyond the biblical hermeneutics, but then he ended up like positing this universal religious anthropology that would existed in all kinds of places. And, and the philologist was better prepared than anybody else to get at that sort of stuff. Where does that fit into your story? Because it seems to me like that's sort of a missing link. And I think I missed it in what you were saying, but like, is there like, how does that fit into this narrative about like the relationship between philology and what tells us capital R religion and the ways that people are trying to make sense of both like mobility? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, I, I don't know that you necessarily missed it. I, I, I don't really kind of engage with what constitutes religion as such, right? I'm, I'm sort of going along with kind of this almost glib notion that, that we understand what religion is. Religion is um, religion is some kind of irrational faith that's not that's not science. Um, and yeah, perhaps perhaps it could make its way into this paper more. And it would be like something I really need to think more about. Right. What is the what is religion? What is the role? What is the role? I mean, this, I mean, this kind of brings to mind these questions that were raised that were raised yesterday. How much can we even create this dichotomy between religion and science? Obviously, kind of buying into. I mean, I guess when I'm saying that I want to overcome this dichotomy that's created, I, I am trying to kind of push back. Maybe I should do so more explicitly. That these are two somehow separate, you know, reified things that you can that you can say have no place um, together. I mean, that's sort of what I was trying to get at by looking at at Teichu, right? That we can't call this either religious, aka unscientific. I mean, those two don't are not mutually uh, mutually exclusive. 